Today, I got the chance to sit down and just pick the brain of one of the top New Testament scholars out there. My friend, Dr. David De Silva, was kind enough to join us here at Disciple Dojo. And we were, well, we talked about a lot of stuff, but the main thing that we talked about was the Apocrypha. This is an area where he is a bona fide expert, having written commentaries on apocryphal books, introductions to the Apocrypha. When it comes to the Apocrypha, David De Silva is a name to know. So David and I had a great discussion. He's so much fun. I can't wait for you guys to see his personality and kind of put a, a face and a voice with the name on the bookshelf or in a bibliography. It's just cool having a personality to go along with it. And so you're going to get to meet David De Silva and see some of that wonderful personality in this discussion. Before you do that, if you haven't already, Please subscribe to the channel, click the notifications icon. Anything you can do that lets YouTube know, hey, we like this channel, we like Disciple Dojo, we want to see it grow, we want to see more of it, all of that stuff really helps us. Now, during the interview, you'll hear David allude to Dojo swag in a proposed barter. If you would like some Dojo swag, head over to our online store. Check out what we have available there, everything from hoodies, t-shirts, we even got yoga pants and jujitsu training gear. There's all kinds of gifts and designs for your favorite Bible nerd out there or just for yourself. So that's another way you can support the Ministry of Disciple Dojo. If you don't really care about any swag, you just want to support what we do, consider becoming a monthly dojo donor. We're able to make all of our resources at Disciple Dojo freely available online only because of our monthly dojo donors. So even if you wanted to just give $5 a month, $10 a month, maybe God's tremendously blessed you and you can throw $100 a month our way. Monthly gifts of any amount that we can count on really help us as we continue to grow this ministry, our teaching ministry here on YouTube, our refugee jitsu outreach here in Charlotte to local refugee, immigrant and lower income kids who just otherwise would not be able to afford to train jujitsu. Our singles ministry on Facebook, the Grown Ups Table, which is growing every day. And we're just past 700 members, people who are single adults looking for community. These are all things that your monthly gift to Disciple Dojo helps us to be able to do. And we are so very thankful for those of you that partner with us on a monthly basis. Thank you so much. If you're interested in becoming a dojo donor, check out the link that's on your screen right now. I'll also put it in the video description. Okay, sit back and enjoy my discussion with Dr. David De Silva. David, it's good to see you again. Uh, I hope you and uh, Donna Jean and the rest of the family are doing well. What have you been up to since SBL? Um, but first, thanks for having me. Do you, do you like to go by James, James Michael, JM? So, what do I call you? That's a great, Sensei? <laughs> that's a great <laughs> question. So family all call me James Michael. And okay. everybody who knew me since seminary goes by JM because when I moved okay. to Boston, New Englanders don't understand double names mm -hmm. very well. So they would shorten it to James. James is my dad, not me. So I would say just if you're going to abbreviate it, go with JM. So they did. JM because it's trendy. It's trendy. It's easier. It's my public name, kind of like N.T. Wright rather than Tom Wright. Last time I saw you, we were in Denver, in warm, tropical Denver at SBL. <laughs> what have you been up to since then, since I last saw you? Well, um, actually, our youngest son got married. Congratulations. I know, right? Uh, that's, that's, um, that was December 10th. Uh -huh. And we survived Advent and Christmas. I'm Always a tough. choir director, so it's a busy time. It's the time no one wonders why I get paid. <laughs> and then getting set for this new semester uh, where I find myself teaching three courses. I was going to ask, what are you teaching this semester? Well, um, introduction to the New Testament as usual. Mm -hmm. uh, exegesis of Galatians, mm -hmm. and then for the new D-Men track that we've launched at Ashland Seminary, um, a course on the world of the New Testament. The follow-up so, to which will be a two-week trip to Israel that I've arranged myself, so none of the tourist spots, all of the yeah. archaeology. So our summer course is going to be great. But anyway, That's getting all that put together, has that's pretty much it. 
How many? (laughs) That's enough. That's more than enough. How many people are you taking on that trip? What's the cap uh, for Uh, that? We have we have uh, six students. Okay. And two of us are bringing our spouses. Very. I'm doing it because I don't share a room with anyone whose last name is not De Silva. That's just. (laughs) How I, roll. So. I don't blame you. I don't blame you at all. And that's because you're a massive snorer, right? Is that really what it is? No. <laughs> I'm a good person, JM. Okay. All right. I won't, I won't push too far then. No, I, I, that's really cool. I took a small group to the Holy Land for Christ at the Checkpoint a few years ago. And, and then we went around and toured with um, one of the local Palestinian tour guides. It was amazing. Wow. And I'm very jealous that people are going to get to go with you and learn and also get to see stuff that's not just your typical get off the bus take some pictures this is the church where so-and-so built such and such back on the bus (laughs) well then you're you are a scholar, a New Testament scholar. And thank you, JM. I appreciate that. You know, I just wanted to let people know in <laughs> case they didn't know. You are a New Testament scholar of the first rank. And you gave the keynote address this year at, at IBR. Is that right? It is. What is, I know only because you explained it to me in a text back and forth. But for people who are watching and they don't know, they know what SBL is because I did a video about my time at SBL. You made a cameo in that. What is IBR? Because they may know ETS, Evangelical Theological Seminary. They may know SBL. I didn't even know about IBR until last year. IBR is that glorious in between. <laughs> between between SBL, where absolutely anything goes, and mm-hmm. you have to have a PhD just to understand the uh, the titles of the presentations. Yes. You have to have two PhDs to care most of the time about the actual presentations. <laughs> this is not lying, and folks. It is all done without, you know, any recourse to faith commitment. In many ways, um, weaving anything that smacks of faith commitment into SBL's uh, uh, programming is just, it's just not done, JM. It's not <laughs> how we roll. Then there's ETS, um, which... Um, how should we say, um, has very strict doctrinal uh, boundaries. Mm-hmm. And so... Um, Mike Lycona so, could talk a little bit about that, I'm sure. Well, I mean, I'm trying to be <laughs> kind here because I do, I do occasionally get invitations to present at ETS and, yes. and I do occasionally actually like to show my face there. But, <laughs> um, but it, is, it is something of a straitjacket. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, or at least it could be if you cared enough, <laughs> I tend not to. I just go drop my bomb, leave for five years, come back again. IBR <laughs> is, is I think, just really the beautiful middle. It stands for Institute for Biblical Research, not Irritable Bowel something, right? whatever. And totally different IBR. <laughs> it, it, is, it is scholars who are committed to being in scholarship because they are committed to the faith and they are committed to the church, but... They're also committed to go where the scholarship leads them, mm-hmm. so they're not um, they're not uh, afraid to color outside particular doctrinal lines if honoring scripture demands it. So, right. of the three, IBR is really you know where I naturally fit most. Although I can, with enough you know forethought, fake it. At the other two, <laughs> you can you can be a chameleon. You can blend in quite easily. I am. I'm a chameleon. Uh, I did not get. I did. I wasn't there for any of the ETS stuff uh, because it was before I got there and and was able to be at your address at IBR, which I thought was great as a Wesleyan leaning Christian Protestant. I thought it was wonderful seeing uh, sanctification talked about in a very openly Wesleyan way from the stage. With a bunch of Calvinists listening, and uh, some and of them giving you feedback. They were very polite. They were they very were. polite. I I have to hand it to them because I could feel I could feel the exercise of the gift of the spirit of patience and gentleness, <laughs> forbearance from many in the room. So yes, yeah. it was evident, and their responses the the responses that were given to your address I thought were were charitable and nice and good, and it was just really cool. I'd never been. That was my first event ever at uh at 
IBR, SBL, everything. And, and they even gave us a free book, which was nice. I know, right? So, and it was a good one. It wasn't just some, you know, cheesy little paperback. It was, you know, New Testament Apocrypha. That was pretty, or not a pseudepigrapha. So that was exciting. But I'm looking forward to next year and, and seeing what's up. It was neat getting to kind of rub shoulders with some of you actual scholars. I just am the, uh, I, I play one on YouTube. So, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I am the guide to people who are outside the academy and they want to just peek in. They don't want to maybe go all the way, but they want to get a peek. So that's what Disciple Dojo provides. And that's why I'm glad that you're here. We're going to talk about some questions that I had and that viewers had about the Apocrypha, and we're going to get your thoughts on those. So before we dive into that, as we're talking about PhD and academia and conferences and things like that, behind you are a number of commentaries and books, and you have written those. You've written a lot. I don't know of anyone who's written I don't know. Maybe are we, are, you Craig or Ben Keener Witherington or Craig Keener? Out of the water. Craig Keener and Ben Witherington blow me out of the water. <laughs> I was going to say, you guys yes, are right. up there. More than blows me out of the water. Yeah, that's On true. Some hand. some of them can sneeze and a book comes out. <laughs> book is uh, out. <laughs> <laughs> but don't sell yourself short. You have written prolifically. Uh, in terms of Disciple Dojo guests, you are by far the most prolific in uh, oh. your bibliography, at least. So commentaries people have um some people are super wary of commentaries like they they don't want to look at a commentary they think it's like worldly learning and they just let the spirit tell them what the bible means and those people then often start cults the other approach that people do is they think commentaries are almost like if you don't read a commentary you haven't really read scripture or understood it and and they immediately jump to commentaries and anything they read in a commentary they take almost as sacrosanct so as someone who's written your share of commentaries uh what i i want to know what's that process like do you get a phone call from you know mr erdman and says i want a commentary to silva have it on my desk you know like what I don't even know, Mr. Erdman's not a real person. I'm just throwing that out. No, he but, is. He, oh, he is actually. There, there was a Bill Erdman. Okay. Founder of the company. He was a, actually a wonderful, gentle soul. He's no longer with us. Meeting him. No, he has. Okay. He has uh, passed on. Okay. Um, but he I was never great. knew. I never yeah, knew it was, was named great. after an actual person. Well, yeah. I mean, I knew it was named William after somebody. William Erdman's publishing was named after yes, William B. Erdman. <laughs> <laughs> Who you knew? This is this is revelations upon revelation. Well, so it's, in all seriousness, what is it? How do you? How does you get invited to write a commentary or get proposed to write a commentary? And then walk us through how it happens. Peel peel back the curtain like Toto in the Wizard of Oz, and show us who's pulling the levers and twirling the knobs behind the <laughs> scenes. So yes, um, uh, typically one gets an invitation to write for a commentary series because commentary series are uh, put together by editors. Mm -hmm. uh, the NICNT, for example, is currently edited by Joel Green, another immensely prolific scholar teaching at Fuller. Yes. Um, and um, formerly by Gordon Fee. Mm -hmm. and, and as it happens, I just happened to bump into Gordon Fee and SBL sometime around like I don't know, 2007, 2008, and we got to talking. And before we were done, he was inviting me to contribute a volume on Galatians, which was really weird because I'd never written on Paul other than, you know, the chapters in my, my introductory textbook. Mm -hmm. um, but I would not have written a commentary on Galatians had the series editor not extended the invitation. Um, now, I have been known to drop hints in the ears of series editors okay. that I would love to write a commentary on blank sometime, especially mm -hmm. for their commentary. Sometimes that meets with um, with, with a typical, oh, well, that's interesting. <laughs> right. Or it, 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 it has also led places. Uh, mm. My first commentary on Hebrews. Uh, really coming out of the starting gate just a couple of years af after my dissertation on Hebrews. Mm -hmm. Ben Witherington and Dwayne Watson were kind enough to take a chance on me, mm -hmm. but 
but I had, you know, like the camel's nose under the tent, been trying to <laughs> <laughs> wrestle that. And then just a couple of months ago, really out of nowhere, Harold Attridge calls and said, hey, you want to write a commentary on 4th Maccabees for Hermeneia? I said, yeah, sure. Why? Why not? <laughs> How's 2032 sound? Oh, fine. Whenever. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I was going to I was going to ask you how how long does it let's say because there are shorter, maybe more popular level commentaries and then there are more extensive scholarly commentaries. So what what's a general time range that either you give yourself or that you're given by the publisher? How does that work? Well, ho hoping that no publishers actually see this video, you know, <laughs> commentary writers are just notorious for neglecting contracted deadlines. Notorious. <laughs> uh, so much so that I've, you know, never really gotten any pushback from publishers when I said, oh, I'm, I'm going to need to push this back another year or two. It's like, yeah, yeah, that's just what y'all do. <laughs> that's how it works. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the Galatians commentary, I, I worked pretty seriously on for about three years. Okay. My Ephesians commentary, which was in, as you say, a, a shorter, a, a series with shorter uh, volume word counts, mm -hmm. I may only have spent a year on. Um, and that would be about the range. I, I Okay. And so also, I've not written a commentary on a huge book. That also helps, right? Galatians, six chapters, granted it's Paul, you gotta do all kinds of other work, but it's still just six chapters when you right. when you sit down. It's not Matthew. Right. That would take longer, I have no doubt. <laughs> um, and what I do when I'm ready to start researching a commentary is I sit down with a Greek text and I read through it several times and I try to figure out what I understand about the text and what I don't, mm. what I know that I need to look into to do justice to expounding the text in a way that others can trust to be reliable. Mm. So the first step is just making lists and lists of questions. Um, mm -hmm. As I go through you know, Galatians 1, 1 to 6, 18, just questions. I need to, what is this, what is Paul doing here? What is this construction? How do I think about the range of this word? Blah, 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 blah. Um, and then that gives me something of, of a clear agenda for working through the immense amount of books already written on Galatians or in some sort of supportive way about the syntax about the lexical meaning, whatever, about the theology of Paul as a background to Galatians, mm -hmm. etc. Um, but really, without that, I, I think I would be lost in a sea of paper, because I still <laughs> use books. I'm old fashioned. I actually like to open up books and mark books. Such a Luddite. Logos, <laughs> and, and what have you. And I love Logos, don't get me wrong, it's great to be able to log in and, and pull up a whole library, but nothing beats sitting with a book with a box of highlighters, because I go yes. through like, like M&Ms. Um, I have these always, <laughs> always exactly. at handy, always. Exactly. <laughs> I'm that I'm that generation, by the way, I'm I'm um, Nate Bargatze, the comedian, he has a, a joke about this, like my because we're the same age, my generation, we're that in between. So we grew up analog, but then college became digital. And so we're bilingual. And I'm very much half of my library is on Accordance and Lagos. And then the other half is behind me here in the study. And I'm yeah. equally like you at ETS and SBL. I move in both worlds. <laughs> and I'm a weird combination of the two. But you made a point that was really good. And I want I want readers to uh, readers. I want viewers to understand <laughs> what you just said when you sit down to write a commentary and this is a biblical scholar folks who's actually does this at a very high level he reads the text and makes note of what questions he has that that would translate into a fantastic bible study practice mm -hmm. for anybody who's not writing a commentary 
just sitting down and reading the text and just starting with what questions do I have? And then the process of looking up answers to those questions, you're head and shoulders above what most people would get in a typical Bible study. So I just want to commend that for viewers. Do that. Be like David De Silva. <laughs> Follow him as he follows Christ. So, well, I mean, the most important thing is knowing what you don't know, right? Yes. And the second most important thing is questioning what you think you do know. Mm -hmm. And the rest is uh, commentary, as Hillel said. <laughs> <laughs> well, when it comes to the rest being commentary, and there are many commentaries out there, do you, let's say for Galatians, did you read every major commentary on Galatians? Uh, in well, order to be able course, to interact. I, am. I read all the scholarship in English, <laughs> French, and German, and yeah. some Italian and Spanish. <laughs> I don't believe Now, that. off the record, no, I read very selectively, or else I'd still be reading yeah. in my grave. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously, yes, as you well know, you've got to identify um, who are the people who have made important contributions to think about this book, mm -hmm. read them. Mm -hmm. wrestle with that. So as I was working through Galatians, obviously J. Lewis Martin was very important. Yes, I had to come to terms with N.T. Wright, mm -hmm. um, um, Hans Dieter Betz and his um, pioneering, if highly flawed, rhetorical critical analysis of Galatians and, and so forth. And then um, sort of major players in Pauline theology at mm -hmm. the same time. Mm -hmm. And then we get into the weeds, um, you know, uh, people who have written on particular uh, pieces of, of Galatians about which I've had questions or which are just really, really important. Like, I probably did read almost everything on Galatians 2, 16 to 21. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, you just, I mean, uh, that, that's, such a, that's such a maze of exegetical questions with theological significance. It right. just, it demands so much attention. Mm -hmm. Now you said earlier, a few minutes ago that you did not, your, your background originally before you wrote that was not in Paul. Is that, did I hear you right? You did so right. how can you be a new Testament scholar and not f have the focus on, I thought Paul equals the new Testament. Is there more in the new Testament than Paul? That's well, scandalous. no, now I realize my mistake. Now that I've worked through Galatians and Ephesians, of course, Paul is the shining light. And I was simply wasting my time with Hebrews and and Revelation and, and what have you, all that stuff in the back 40 of the canon. <laughs> what drew you initially, though, in all seriousness, most people, when they do New Testament, they just kind of default to, you know, Romans and Corinthians Jesus or Paul. Jesus or Paul. Those they pick those two. Places. So you went the Jesus route. No, I went the Hebrews route. That's even more unheard of. Yes. Yeah, how did you get there? How did you how did that become your interest? And honestly, uh, yeah, um, I, I had written my master's thesis on Second Corinthians mm -hmm. and I was going to work on that more for my dissertation. But in all honesty, by the time I got through my comprehensive exams, I was sick of Second Corinthians. <laughs> I couldn't do another thing with 2 Corinthians, so I trashed uh -huh. that whole idea. And I went back to a book that I fell in love with when I was doing campus ministry at Westminster Choir College while I was a student at Princeton Seminary, uh -huh. and that was Hebrews. Uh -huh. um, and I'd, I had led a group through it. Um, I, I actually had compiled about 30 single-spaced uh, typed pages of notes on Hebrews mm -hmm. with them. And I thought, you know, Hebrews was great. I'm going to see, I'm going to read through Hebrews a couple of times and see if mm. maybe a dissertation topic arises out of that. So, um, so what I did was I took a bunch of Xerox copies of Hebrews and Greek mm. um, and a bunch of different colored pens and a ruler. And I just started outlining um, the topics that I found in Hebrews relevant to, and this anticipates something that we'll talk about later, I'm, I'm sure, um, honor and shame, patronage, reciprocity scripts, mm -hmm. purity and pollution language, kinship language, a bunch of other things that I can't remember right now, uh, because they didn't make it into that book of mine. <laughs> um, and, and 
I stepped back and at the end of the week or however long it took me, I thought, okay, this is really interesting. Look at, at these places of overlap where some of these, um, some of these uh, topics just sort of cluster. Uh, maybe I can work with this. And uh, before three months had passed, I had a dissertation proposal to look at honor and shame language in Hebrews and how the author was using this to um, to help a beleaguered community of Christians persevere in the face of ongoing disrespect, marginalization, being made to feel like worthless members of society. Mm -hmm. Yep, and there it was. Despising shame was born. That is a key theme in a lot of the intertestamental writing, the apocryphal writing as well, a beleaguered nice community. Nice segue there. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even plan that. You just set it up and I teed it off. But in all seriousness, that is, that's, I, I, I've just finished uh, reviewing the Jewish annotated apocrypha and your book, uh, your the introduction by Lexham, the apocrypha, the LES translation that you provided all the book intros for. And that was one of the, re I mean, that's a reoccurring theme in all of the apocryphal writings is how do you, before Christ, as faithful Jews, maintain your purity, maintain your cohesiveness as a community in the face of overwhelming Hellenistic pressure, and then later in the face of overwhelming Roman pressure for early Christians, uh, is that was that part of where your interest in apocryphal works began, or did it kind of flow out of that, or was that a separate story altogether? No, no, absolutely. Um, I mean, it, it has deeper roots in my life, but as I was doing the the work for the dissertation itself. Yeah, I looked at Wisdom of Solomon, 4th Maccabees, the Wisdom of Ben Sirah. Uh, these were uh, important focal background texts setting up how I was going to then be examining the letter to the Hebrews. And of course, that just kept me hooked in that mm -hmm. body of literature. Mm -hmm. And it also, it, it, it was also the study of those books alongside Greco-Roman texts like philosophical texts, Seneca's on the constancy of the wise person or Epictetus uh, discourses and, and Enchiridion. Um, noticing this, this pattern that if, if a teacher wanted his or her pupils, disciples to value what the masses did not value or to value what was not publicly celebrated Mm -hmm. um, they had to develop some strategies to to keep those those communities focused on values that were not otherwise socially reinforced, mm -hmm. and to to create uh, social reinforcement mechanisms within these sub communities, these subcultures, uh, so that um, so that individuals could could remain committed to the values they had embraced and not have that commitment kind of eroded by the lack of value they saw placed on it day after day uh, amongst the masses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you write a lot about that in, in Honor, Patron, Kinship and Purity of how, about how it's it's a it's kind of like a we in modern analogies, we might say if there's a derisive term, uh, then a group will reclaim that term. They'll start using, they'll take ownership of that term and kind of flip the script and it becomes a badge of honor, but that's nothing new that's right. been going on. I mean, the cross is the ultimate example of that, of flipping a script and turning something that's utter shame into something that you glory in. The same thing with you and I are both Methodist. Methodism was a derisive insult and right. they took it and said, no, I mean, you mean it as an insult, but we take that as a badge of honor. And that's a really powerful psychological process. And it's nothing new, which your book definitely does a deep dive on that concept for people. We're going to get back to that book in a minute. And I'm going to plug that book because it just came out last year in the second edition. And I'm going to we'll plug it again. But Thank Apocrypha. You, Absolutely. I'm here for you. Disciple Dojo is here for the you, the scholars. You come on here, you get a good book plug. Shh, tell your friends. Uh, but in all seriousness, the Apocrypha is something that outside of 
uh, you know, Catholic, Orthodox, maybe some Episcopalian circles. The Apocrypha gets no love in Protestants and in Protestantism, and some Protestants even say, "Well, you shouldn't read it." They, in their mind, they think Apocrypha is right up there with, you know, the Satanic Bible. Exactly, <laughs> <laughs> and there's a fear of it. Even the name Apocrypha, hidden, that's that seems to connote some kind of mysterious, dubious quality. So. I'm assuming viewers watching this, some of them may have a little bit of knowledge of the Apocrypha, some may have none at all. And we'll just, I will just take them in the order that they are in, the in Lexham's uh, Apocrypha. And I just want you to give a quick, if I say the name of a book, give a quick like one to two sentence, this is what it's about and this is why it matters. Does that make sense? So, sure. and I won't- sure. I'm still stumbling over the make it quick Part. Okay, whatever. <laughs> I'll give it my best shot. In scholar talk, that means 30 minutes. All right. There you go. Each, so. <laughs> I, and I won't do if books have a shorter or a longer version. We'll just, you know, one book together. So let's start with a book that does have a shorter and a longer version, Tobit. What is Tobit? And if I mispronounce a name, by the way, absolutely correct me. Um, I'd never heard the word Incaridian. And you just said that a minute ago. I've never heard right. it said out loud. I've only seen it read. So feel free to correct pronunciation. But well, Tobit, tell us about Tobit. Why should we, what is it? Why read it? It's a story of a boy, an angel, and a fish. <laughs> um, one of the things that, that's great about Tobit is it's just entertaining. It's, it's a nice, entertaining story from about 200 B.C., and it, it gives us a great window into the ethics of Jews 200 years before Christ, because the dad of Tobit uh, lays on some fatherly advice at two points. It gives us a window into uh, hopes of, of Jews, of Israelites in this period, because the last two chapters are like uh, uh, um, uh, an expression by the dad Tobit by name, about all the great things God would yet do for Jerusalem and for the nations and for his name. And it gives us a window into um, sort of popular theology where angels and demons have a much larger role than anything we would expect from the books of the Hebrew Bible. Mm -hmm. And yet, exactly what we encounter in the pages of the Gospels where um, angels pop up all the time and demons are in every third person that you meet. <laughs> so that's Tobit. I love it. <laughs> Tobit, one, one thing I noticed in reading it, and I won't do this with all the books, but I just thought it was interesting in Tobit, there's a great, uh, there's an emphasis at the end about, is it the angel not eating? And so when you read that, you just think, well, that's how you know that this is not a, an earthly fleshly being they didn't eat and then after jesus appears the new testament makes specific he ate with his disciples and, and knowing that tobit background it's like shouts even more clearly this is not a spirit this is not you know he's real and bodily yeah. that was an insight i got in reading it that's good um but let's move on okay that's i won't give any more commentary judith what is judith who is judith why you should never get drunk with a woman of the enemy camp, no matter how beautiful she is and how much you want her. Solid advice. You might, you might just lose your head. Over <laughs> what value does Judith have for a New Testament Christian? It is entertaining and it is funny, uh, filled well, with irony. It, it is. The irony is, is delicious. But I think one of the greatest values it has, which also shows up in Tobit, and I would just say shows up in so many of these texts, is the, the deep roots that Deuteronomy's theology of the covenant has taken. Because mm -hmm. from beginning to end, uh, a story like Judith reinforces the idea when we keep the covenant, things go well. We enjoy mm -hmm. God's favor, God's protection. When we do not keep the covenant, we are, um, uh, we are then exposed to actual danger. And then, on the other hand, um, it's a story about, about what God can do through any 
through any vessel that is faithful and willing. Um, and in some ways, Judith is, is a book that, that celebrates what God can do through a faithful woman, mm -hmm. which in, say, 100 BC is, is a, bit of a, a bit of a surprise uh, to, to readers soaked in patriarchal culture. But it celebrates, and this is where it's also really not the feminist best friend, um, that God can do such marvels even through the hand of a woman. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, a, a story of God's marvelous intervention through faithful, courageous people, even though uh, they seem too weak to pull it off. Mm. What am I missing? Fill it in, JM. No. This is your show. This is no, your no. Show. Fill it in any way, any way you want. Nothing to add to that, except right. if you like the book of Judges, you will enjoy the book of Judith, I think. Yes. If you're an Old Testament person and Judges is your jam, check out Judith. Okay. <laughs> alliteration, by the way. There we go. I'm all about the word, uh, the, the, the diction. So let's talk about Greek. What is Greek Esther? Esther's Hebrew. What is Greek Esther all about? Well, um... Greek Esther shows us how, how much some Jews wished that the book of Esther talked about God more <laughs> and, and brought the Torah and its requirements for good, faithful Jews out more uh, and showed us something of piety and prayer at work. Because let's face it, Esther is not great... Um, devotional reading if you're interested in Jewish identity, Jewish practices, piety. Um, and it may be that this is one of the, the reasons it was a, a less favorite book for the Hebrew canon in mm -hmm. the end. But Greek Esther solves all these problems. First, with six additional scenes, deleted scenes, bonus scenes, mm -hmm. um, uh, which insert uh, uh, dream visions and their interpretation, uh, pious prayers by Mordecai and Esther before the main event, um, formal edicts issued in the king's name, the first one at Haman's initiative, the second one pretty much at Mordecai's initiative, that give us uh, good windows into Jew-Gentile tensions of the period. Mm. And then all throughout the rest of the book, it's not just the big additions, but there are little additions throughout the whole book made to make God a major player, to make it clear that Esther did not like having to share a bed with an uncircumcised guy, mm -hmm. to make it clear that Esther did not break the rules of kashrut. Uh, this is where you say, bless you. <laughs> uh, uh, while she was in, while she was uh, there, she did not drink the wine of libations that had been poured out to gods. So all the problems uh, with having a good Jewish girl there in the court of the king, how can she maintain her covenant fidelity, are solved mm -hmm. uh, in the course of this, this uh, much more pious and Jewish version. Do you think that it was... So let me press you on this. Do you think that it was a good move or a bad move to add those things theologically? Do you think the strength of Esther in its Hebrew text lies in how God seems, even when he seems hidden, he's still acting by the scenes? Or do you think that it was a needed move? Or do you just see them as they're two separate things and they complement each other and we should just enjoy both? Well, the politic answer would, of course, be to come out at that, that last point. <laughs> um, but no, I like Greek Esther far more than Hebrew Esther, <laughs> for all the reasons uh, just named. Um, uh, what is more important? That's for God to decide. Mm -hmm. And obviously, we, we have derived a lot more, uh, a lot of, of theological value from the Esther as we know it, the older version of mm -hmm. Esther uh, as we know it because in our lives and our nations, we have had to trust that God was at work where God was quite behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. But I like Greek Esther. <laughs> <laughs> it, <laughs> literarily. It, it's, 
But but you see, there's also this that 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 Hebrew Esther is really kind of a product of of Persian period Judaism, okay. but Greek Esther is a product of Hellenistic era Judaism, um, mm-hmm. and and it 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 reflects a lot more of the um, the self awareness of the tensions and the struggles that Hellenistic era Jews faced that were just a whole lot. Mm, more latent or mm. just not as big a deal back in the Persian period. Uh, yeah. For reasons that we'll get to when you ask me about first and second Maccabees. <laughs> well then, I guess now I, nope. Well, we got a couple of more. I'm following the order of Lexum, so we've got to get through Wisdom of Solomon. Probably what is the wisdom? prince of all the apocryphal books. The wisdom of Solomon. Um, so what do you mean by the prince of? You mean the most closest to being canonical or being considered canonical? Or do you mean, uh, unpack that. Well, I just like it best. <laughs> Done. There we go. <laughs> no, but um, that, uh, while that is true, it is, uh, along with the next one you're going to mention, because I kind of know how the yeah, how the right. table of contents goes, um, <laughs> Wisdom of Solomon and and the Wisdom of Ben Sira are the most frequently quoted books of the Apocrypha mm-hmm. uh, throughout the patristic period. So among the Apocryphal texts that, that played a role shaping Christian theology, Christian ethics, Christian reflection, these two books uh, play the largest part. And between the two, I just like The Wisdom of Solomon more. It's a nice, mm. cohesive uh, um, uh, work, uh, which, what? It, it, the first five uh, chapters give us um, maybe one of our, our earliest and fullest expressions of the post-mortem vindication of the righteous uh, that becomes so important during the Greek uh, period. Uh, when really fidelity to the covenant moves one closer to the edges of society and sometimes puts one in the grave prematurely. Mm. So um, it, it, it provides this fabulous encouragement uh, to remain faithful in the face of testing um, so that, or, or in the assurance that God will in fact vindicate the honor of God's righteous ones in the sight of their detractors and in some cases their persecutors. Mm -hmm. And then this middle section, chapters six through nine, this uh, more or less this expansive reflection on on wisdom, the figure of wisdom that would be familiar to us from Proverbs eight, but just um, undergoes such developments, either by the time of or simply in the writing of this book and it's those pieces that become so important for early Christian reflection on Christ. Mm-hmm. So, so here we have a literary testimony to what Jews were thinking about the, the figure of wisdom as, as um, a mediator of God and as a reflection uh, of God's very image and, and all these things that then give early Christians the vocabulary to talk about the relationship of the Son to the Father. Um, mm-hmm. And then the last half of the book, this reflection on this midrashic reflection on Exodus and the conquest narratives um, that, uh, at least from my point of view, shows us um, how the central event that formed Jewish what, identity mm-hmm. is being reflected on in about 50 BC or somewhere between 50 BC and 20 AD. So a treasure trove, the wisdom of Solomon. Well, there's, uh, would you, do you agree or do you think that in Romans one, Paul is drawing from wisdom of Solomon? I think it's chapter 14. Uh, it is 13 and 14 in wisdom of Solomon, Romans mm-hmm. one, the, the, if you were to line out the topics side by side, it, it would it would argue strongly for literary dependence mm-hmm. because the progression is the same in both. Um, and unlike many, um, well, actually, I don't. Unlike some, at least, I don't think Paul is quoting or or reproducing this Hellenistic Jewish argument to dismiss it. I think he quotes it because he fully embraces it, mm-hmm. even if he does then take it a step further and say, and by the way. 
we Jews haven't kept up our end before right. God either. And so right. whether you're an idolatrous Gentile whose idolatry has 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 propelled him or her into a world of vice, or a covenant disobedient Jew whose practice has brought God's honor into disrepute, we stand equally in need of of the new beginning, the reconciliation, a new beginning that God has made possible in Christ. Well, that's so well said. I could not agree more. I've had this, uh, I've had a, a friendly argument with a New Testament uh, scholar friend who, um, or was was doing some New Testament work. I don't know if he, he didn't finish his PhD, but uh, who was saying, no, there's Paul's not, he's talking about something else. He's, and I was like, dude, it's, <clears throat> Wisdom <laughs> is right there. He's this was the air that he breathed as a Pharisee before coming to Christ, and this it, I I think it's undeniable that he's like you said drawing from and maybe drawing from a common Jewish view also rather than possible. specifically the text right. of Wisdom of Solomon. But uh, that to me had the most affinity of any New Testament passage I think I read in in Wisdom was seeing how Paul you know. It's like I could you just hear Paul reading part of it going, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is I'm I'm gonna tell him this too. <laughs> well I then this. I can use this. Right, right. This is good, good stuff. stuff. Uh well, so how what's the distinction? You don't have to go into uh Ben Sirach or the wisdom of Sirah, but the the name will confuse some people. Ah. Wisdom of Solomon, wisdom of Sirah, uh, or Ben Sirah, or Sirach, or Ecclesiasticus, all these different yeah. names. What is the difference between the two books? They're both forms of wisdom. They're both Jewish uh, uh, rules of, not rules, but axioms of the, the good life and what it should be. What's the difference between them? Wisdom of Solomon is written in Greek by a Hellenistic Jew much later than Wisdom of Ben Sirah. Wisdom of Solomon is sued epigraphic. That's the word for the day. <laughs> it's 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 attributed to Solomon. It's written as if by a king of Israel, mm -hmm. um, and and part of the reason it's called wisdom of Solomon is that um, the the prayer that is contained in wisdom of Solomon six or seven in effect expands exponentially Solomon's prayer for wisdom, mm. um, and, and and it is offered as if kind of a midrashic expansion on that. But it's sued epigraphic. It was written by Herschel, a Jew in Alexandria. No, I don't know. <laughs> some anonymous Jew, uh, some highly literate and, um, and and rhetorically adept Jew mm -hmm. um, uh, in, in the diaspora. And then the wisdom of Ben Sira is really the written curriculum of a Hebrew sage who was active uh, as the head of a school in Jerusalem between about 200 and 180 BC. Um, and it's not pseudepigraphic. Pseudo it's actually written by a guy who was descended from Sirach, Yeshua ben Sirah, uh, we're told toward the, toward the end of the, of the book. And um, he writes down, in effect, um, a, a, a precy, an epitome, of of what he's been trying to get across to the young Jewish elites that have been sent to his his school for scribal training. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a wonderful window into kind of the curriculum of a Jerusalem school 200 years before Jesus. And it's written much more like Proverbs than Wisdom mm -hmm. of Solomon is. Wisdom of Solomon is a very kind of cohesive, argument or, or, or display. Uh, ben Sira is, is what we're more used to in that we basically have paragraph length instructions throughout. We don't have any of the fortune cookie length instru instructions that Proverbs <laughs> gives us for the last 20 chapters or so. Right. But paragraph length, uh, very much like James, the mm. epistle uh, of James in form. Mm -hmm. And Ben Sira was immensely influential. Um, in Judea, uh, so much so that we find uh, him being quoted. Now, I didn't count this out myself. I'm relying on the work of Solomon Schechter, but quoted at least a hundred times in extant rabbinic literature. Hmm. So, I value Ben Sira 
um, as, um, as a text that lets me into the stuff that sages were passing on while Jesus and his brothers were learning about their faith and practice in the synagogues of Galilee. Mm. Uh, and, and so not, not to make my short two sentence pitch on Ben Sira. These are Pauline <laughs> sentences. So you're These good. Are Pauline. Yes, exactly. Right. <laughs> um, um, I have found numerous places where, uh, where Jesus will pass on instructions that have no parallel in the Hebrew Bible, but they have parallels in texts like Ben Sira and Tobit. Hmm. Which makes me think even, you know, I, I wouldn't suggest that Jesus had read these books, but I would suggest that Jesus got these ideas and embraced these ideas from what he learned growing up in the synagogues of Galilee or his trips to Jerusalem during festival times. And we know that he didn't just go as a tourist. He liked to hang out with the sages in the temple. Right. right. So, yeah. These are the kind of things he would have been exposed to regardless so here's my favorite, because you know I'm I, I'm I'm the guest and you're, you're too you're too what's the word hospitable to just cut me out cut me uh, short, <laughs> you know. In the Lord's prayer, um, when we pray, forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors, and that's the one petition that receives a comment in in uh, the Sermon on the Mount. For if you forgive people their debts, my heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you forgive people not their debts, neither will my heavenly Father forgive you. You don't find this in the Hebrew Bible. You do find very similar teaching in Ben Sirach, hmm. um, uh, who instructs his, his pupils, forgive others their faults so that your transgressions may be forgiven. If you as a human, as a mere mortal, hold grudges against others, how can you expect God to forgive you your offenses against him? So it, it, awareness of Ben Sirah and Tobit and others of these texts just um, show the embeddedness and the points of uh, the, the greater points of overlap between the teachings of Jesus or his brother James and their Jewish environment than we would suspect otherwise mm. if we didn't read them. I think they also, in addition, or as part of that, I think they help to correct a lot of pr certainly Protestant, but also Catholic, but especially Protestant misunderstandings of Judaism and what Jews believed and, and how Jesus, even in, you know, you read some theology from the 1800s, 1900s, and it's just blatantly anti-Semitic that uh, the, the Jews were basically wallowing in filth and killing each other as barbarians. And blah, blah. I mean, I'm exaggerating, but it's almost that what you get. And then Jesus comes along and gives the true noble, a.k.a. white man's religion that we should all ascribe to. And the, like it just becomes this gross caricature. And 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 it, and even that trickles down. I mean, obviously, people wouldn't embrace that as is, but that trickles into how people have looked at, well, Jews believe this, but Christians believe this. And there's way more overlap than that's what I learned during Judaism January here in Disciple Dojo is I spent all January reading specifically non-Christian yeah. Jewish resources and doing reviews on them. And that was that was one of the main things that you can take away from that is how a misunderstood Judaism is in all of its different traditions, because it's not monolithic by any means. Um, but to me, that's a good exercise in kind of re in a healthy way, reclaiming the Jewishness of Jesus, uh, which well, we'll talk about in a little bit more. Y you might have already covered this in Judaism January. I, I have to confess, I'm way behind on your videos. In my what? Opinion. How dare you? Know, you don't you don't know, watch right? them when they premiere? <laughs> They're, they're you don't show your class. They're on my watch list. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take but I, it. <laughs> but I go to Netflix first in the evening, I have to confess. I don't blame you. But, you know, I'm, I'm having this conversation often with individual students in my classes who, who come in um, thinking of the Judaism of Jesus' time as legalistic, mm -hmm. as externalistic, as all about sort of ritual 
uh, formalism um, and and who are reluctant to use the word grace to talk about how Jews thought about their own uh, their own religious experience and I don't know why I keep formulating new responses to their posts. I could just cut and paste from last year's for this year's and this year's <laughs> to next year's because it's it's constant. Um, but but if we don't understand um, uh, Judaism from first century Judaism from inside first century Judaism, we're not going to understand what Paul was actually taking issue with. Right. It's not a matter of belief versus practice faith versus works it's a matter of following the torah or following the spirit but still yes. both are manifestations of god's grace mm -hmm. both lead to practice anyway absolutely amen to that don't get me started don't get me started oh, hey i i could not agree more and i also viewers who are intrigued by this thought and have not heard it before. I would recommend from an Old Testament perspective, check out Carmen Imes' book, Bearing God's Name, and Christopher Wright's book, The Mission of God and the Mission of God's People, because they give an Old Testament perspective that complements exactly what David's saying here in terms of the New Testament. And, and they show there's a Protestants especially have misunderstood what Jews believed in the time of Jesus. And so that's a huge part of this reclaiming the apocryphal writings uh, as a window into that world. Yeah. Um, let's, let's buzz through a few more and I want, we'll, we'll group some of these together. Baruch and the letter of Jeremiah. What are those? What's going on there? Well, you see, you've just done what everyone does. You have grouped them together. <laughs> But of Scandalous. course, they're completely different and unrelated documents that always get grouped together, such that letter of Jeremiah shows up as Baruch 6 in, in the King James Bible. <laughs> but well, please authors, set the record straight. Different authors, different audiences. Um, letter of Jeremiah is easy to talk about. It's, um, it, it is written as if by Jeremiah, but not by Jeremiah. Um, and it's it's um, it's a it's a letter of instruction to Jews living in diaspora, surrounded by Gentiles who are very pious, very devoted to their gods, and whose devotion to their gods could give the impression that there's something to these gods. And so, letter of Jeremiah exists to say, "Don't be fooled by what you see. Don't be taken in." They do all these things, but they are not gods. Do not bow down to them. And that's the refrain throughout the whole letter of Jeremiah. So it's a it's a great piece of Hellenistic Jewish anti-idolatry polemic. Mm. So good that Christian apologists would quote from it generously in the second and third centuries, reusing it again um, in their quest to... Um, to insulate their own against idolatrous practices and also um, convince outsiders that, hey, what y'all are doing is ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> and then Baruch, which some people don't really like. They say it's a, such a highly derivative book. Mm. It's so unoriginal, uh, which is true. Baruch um, has so much in it uh, that has parallels in Daniel uh, chapter 9 or in Isaiah or in um, um, uh, Job, or what have you. But I look at Baruch and I think, what a marvelous anthology, kind of a rewritten anthology uh, that puts the truth of Deuteronomy's theology of the covenant out there. So from beginning to end, it's like, it, it's like five chapters of theological therapy for Jews in exile or in the land, but suffering Gentile domination, saying, in effect, we need to take careful stock of our violations of the covenant and repent. We need to return to the Torah, God's gift to us, the greatest gift of wisdom, given to us alone of all peoples on the earth. So the middle of Baruch, by the way, is a great text that shows us, hey, Jews didn't think the Torah was a burden. They thought it was an amazingly special gift that God gave them. And mm -hmm. those poor Gentiles who do not know the way to please God. 
And then if we return to the Torah in earnest, to the fount of wisdom, then um, the, the desolation of Zion will be reversed and uh, uh, she will welcome back her exiled children as they return from every land to a renewed uh, place in her. So it's, it's, it's just a really fabulous reworking of key Jewish traditions, scriptural traditions, um, really to minister, I would say, to the, the, the plight of Jews in exile or under Gentile domination in the early Hellenistic period. Where did the name Baruch come from then? Is it written as if, is it pseudographical as well? Sorry, yes, I, I should have uh, should have mentioned that. Baruch, of course, was Jeremiah's scribe. Mm -hmm. And so Baruch became a favorite figure upon which to pin new books that that the historical book ought to have written but didn't. <laughs> and so this is the the earliest of the of those uh, attributed to him because he was available. And then, you know, uh, it's not in the Apocrypha, but there's a great apocalypse known as Second Baruch, mm. um, which looks back upon the destruction of Jerusalem and the Temple in 70 AD and tries to make sense of how to go on being Jewish in, in light of their destruction. And so um, a, a brilliant author in the post-destruction era thought, hey, this isn't the first time we've dealt with this. <laughs> Jews have dealt with this before. So yeah. he kind of imaginatively enters into the mind and the situation of the historical Baruch, hmm. who also had to deal with the same, uh, the same crisis and the same reconstruction. Hmm. And there's a third and fourth Baruch too, but time would fail us to go through <laughs> the whole list. Well, we're going to finish the uh, apocryphal books, uh, and then I'm going to ask you about those others, but not in nearly as much detail. The I'm, I'm going to skip for a minute the Maccabees. We'll come back to that. I'm going to end with Maccabees for reasons of my own. But tell me about... It's your show, JM. <laughs> that's right. I call the shots in this dojo. So th the additions to Daniel, real quick, what's going on there? Um, uh, like Greek Esther, um, Daniel, um, not for the same reasons, but it attracted additional material. And this it just is a window into how Jews treated um, the stories they treasured. Uh, if six tales of Daniel are good, eight are better. <laughs> so we have the story of, of Susanna mm -hmm. um, and the story of, of Bell and the dragon. Additional tales in which Daniel shows his, um, his supernatural insight. In, in the case of Bell and the Dragon, also taking pot shots at Gentile idolatrous practices, showing how, how fake they are, how mm -hmm. manufactured they are. And then in the, in the midst of Daniel 3, the story of the three young men in the furnace, this becomes a, an opportunity to interject some liturgical pieces. Because, I mean, this is such a miracle, right? Mm -hmm. How do you just experience this miracle? and not have a really meaningful prayer up front and not have a wonderful psalm of celebration uh, afterward. Mm. So someone fixed that by sticking like 80 additional verses <laughs> of liturgical texts into this otherwise tight and enjoyable story. Uh, but I'm glad they did because those liturgical texts have been part of Christian liturgy uh, since at least the fifth century, even mm. to the present day, it's still in the Book of Common Prayer. Which really, closet Episcopalians like to use. <laughs> uh, Sirach is in Book of Common Prayer too, right? Are there passages well, from Sirach? There are just a couple of lessons from from Sirach and okay. Tobit and Wisdom of Solomon and Baruch, but they're yeah. they're they're now just alternative lessons. So you can avoid the Apocrypha as an Episcopalian now. <laughs> I knew they were included. I didn't know to what degree. Um, they, uh, the prayer of Manasseh. Mm. Now, Manasseh is a pretty horrible person in the Bible. And then there's this prayer of repentance. What's going on? Um, so, yes, in 2 Kings, you don't get worse than Manasseh. Mm -hmm. He's the reason, what, that... Josiah and, 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 and others who are pious reformers can't turn the tide back. But in Chronicles, 
Manasseh has a change of heart while he's in prison. And he prays to the Lord, and he's released and restored, which frankly I don't get, which is why I like Second Kings better than Second Chronicles. I mean, <laughs> please. But um, what about this prayer? Mm -hmm. It isn't contained in Chronicles. It's lost. Uh, a, a pious Jew sees this as an opportunity to create another wonderful liturgical piece, uh, a great prayer of repentance. Mm -hmm. which is called the prayer of Manasseh. It's not actually attributed to him, but it, it looks like it's written from the perspective of Manasseh because it is a penitential prayer um, by one who is burdened down with chains. So uh, a prisoner like Manasseh. And this is another, uh, another apocryphal text that has had a great afterlife in Christian liturgy, again, since the fifth century in um, Codex Alexandrinus, it is included in the book of Odes, the first hymnal supplement, right after the book of Psalms. And ever since then, it has had a place in Christian liturgy as a penitential psalm. Mm. It's, in, it's it, not people that don't know the Old Testament, maybe very familiarly, uh, the prayer of Manasseh, to me, I would read like the, that title sounds like the prayer of Stalin or the prayer of Pol Pot. Uh, like this just horrible, horrible person. And then wait, what? There's a prayer. They prayed and then you read it and it's this repentant. And it, it really brings up the question of, you know, can somebody who's so utterly evil genuinely repent and, and come to faith in the Lord? And uh, it's it, but just the title, we, you know, we don't think of Manasseh because it's also a Hebrew tribe name and it's, you right. know, but the, this Manasseh is a pretty terrible Manasseh. So that's what makes the prayer literarily even just have more oomph and it more is, unexpectedness. Indeed. But that's also kind of the difference between Second Kings and Second Chronicles. Mm -hmm. Second Kings proclaims a judgment that can't be reversed. Second Chronicles, that author comes along and says, who is truly beyond God's mercy if they mm -hmm. repent? Mm-hmm. On the other side of judgment as well, when right, exactly, you know that, yeah, Kings and Chronicles together, I still haven't landed like I, they still blur together to me. But I haven't taught through each book one by one as I have with others. So maybe when I get there, <laughs> when it, Richard Middleton is working on a Samuel commentary, and I want to hurry him along so he can right. get something about Kings out there that I can glean from. <laughs> have mercy. Have mercy on these scholars. It, it takes beleaguered. more work to finish a commentary than you might think. <laughs> what? <laughs> Whatever. You just sit down and make stuff up. We all know how it really works. <laughs> there are a couple of more that confuse. Uh, psalm 151 is yeah. It's just another psalm, and it's so short. We we actually went through and read the whole psalm in my uh, Apocrypha video published prior to this one, so people can check that out. But the books that confuse me, <clears throat> I want to I want you to give a little nugget on how they cannot be as confusing to those of us non apocryphal experts. Um, psalms of Solomon, Wisdom of Solomon. What's going on? They as easily would get confused. So. You got to keep the titles straight in your head. Mm -hmm. Wisdom of Solomon is actually part of the Apocrypha. It has had a, a major influence in the Christian churches by virtue of being part of the Old Testament of two thirds of the world's Christians. Mm -hmm. Psalms of Solomon, uh, a pseudo epigraphical collection of poems written in Hebrew um, that, that also had some afterlife, as it were, in, in Christian circles, but it's part of the pseudepigrapha. It's not part of the apocrypha. It's it's even beyond that collection. It's um, like Enoch, First Enoch. Or it's like First Enoch. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. Psalms of Solomon are very valuable. I, I read them occasionally just for their own value, not because I have to. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they give us a window into into how Jews reacted to Pompey the Great's uh, siege of Jerusalem in 63 BC, mm -hmm. at the end of the Hasmonean dynasty, um, and and 
reacting to um or yeah reacting to the 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 corruption the perceived corruption of the Jerusalem leadership that invited Pompey's intervention in the first place mm -hmm. um and that look forward to God setting things right under the Lord Messiah so this fabulous collection written from maybe between 63 and 30 BC uh, right. Very important, both for history, for just sheer piety, because some mm -hmm. of the psalms are are just really wisdom psalms or penitential psalms, just basic psalms, or for the development of messianism in the period. Mm -hmm. Psalm of Solomon number seventeen is is of immense value in that regard. Mm -hmm. So then, that's the huge thing for people to know off the bat. Wisdom of Solomon Apocrypha, Psalms of Solomon, not Apocrypha. I guess uh, I could have just said that. Sorry, JM. <laughs> I just, you know, I, I get it. I'm a summarizer. No, you do the deep dive and then I sum it up for the dummies. <laughs> That's how this works. Um, th another, t the two books I mentioned that sometimes get confused uh, are those books of known as Esdras and then mm -hmm. Enoch. People sometimes kind of, they all run together. And I even had questions on YouTube and Facebook. People wanted to know why is first Enoch, given how important it is, I mean, it even makes an appearance in the New Testament. Why is it not included in the apocryphal works? Was it just written too late? Was it not written in Greek or was it written in Greek or what's going, why is it out? Why did it get left out into the pseudepigraphical collections? Um. First Enoch, at least some layers of it, are probably older than any of the other books in the Apocrypha. Mm. So it's not age. Okay. Um, and if anything, books written in Hebrew have a better pedigree than books written in Greek. Right. So it's not that because First Enoch was written uh, in all of its layers in Hebrew and only then translated into other languages. But I think ultimately um, it, it's it's – it's the number of communities that found books to be valuable, formative for who they were, formative for their ethos, that determine um, canonical placement. So we all agree that the books of the Hebrew Bible are vitally important, even if we never read half of them. <laughs> Let's be honest. <laughs> um, but... Um, more communities, more early Christian communities, found Wisdom of Solomon or Tobit or Ben Sirah to be valuable than books like the Psalms of Solomon or First Enoch or Jubilees or so many of these others. Mm -hmm. They remained more esoteric, the property mm -hmm. of smaller enclaves, smaller groups, never really broke into the mainstream, for want of a better way to put it. Mm -hmm. And so they didn't achieve... Um, the level of love among an, enough communities to emerge in um, in competition for a place, as it were, in the canonical core. Hmm. That makes sense. That makes sense because Jubilees is another one mentioned that right. we don't get into. That one was, I mean, there are more copies of that than any other of the works at Qumran. It was massively, but not widespread, just with the Qumran community. And then later, the I had mistakenly in my, inter, in my review said the Coptic, but it's actually somebody told me, no, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. That's right. Exactly has Jubilees right. in its canon. And Jubilees is and fascinating. First Enoch. And first Enoch's in yeah. Ethiopian Orthodox as well? Yeah. Wow. This is why we have the scholars on, folks. They, they set us straight. So I, the first Enoch was, I mean, Jubilees was in the Jewish annotated Apocrypha. It's the first one. And they say this is not technically Apocrypha, but it's so important for Qumran and for early Ethiopian Jews. Right. And so they put it, and I'd never read, I'd never read it last month for the first time. And was like, this is really, really interesting stuff. Uh, good reading. So the last two books that I can't keep straight in my head, two groups of books, Esdras, because there's four of them. Right? Three or four? Six? Six. Five. Yeah, okay. There's a lot. Six. And then Maccabees, because Maccabees are never one, two, three, four. They're one, two, and then other stuff, and then three and four. So even Maccabees aren't always grouped together. And some of them don't even have anything to do with the Maccabean revolt. This is true. So uh, you got to, you got to, this will be the last apocryphal thing I ask you, but bring some sanity to how I, me, 
as a Bible nerd, a bona fide Bible nerd, can't keep straight Esdras and Maccabees, how can readers or viewers out there hope to make sense of these books or at least place them in our sure. minds so that when we do read them, we'll have a better understanding of what we're reading? So Esdras is the worst by far. <laughs> and we, 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 we look at an apocryphal book that is called First Esdras. First Esdras is kind of a retelling of the tail end of Second Chronicles, um, maybe half of Ezra and a little bit of the book of Nehemiah. And it retells it, reshapes it for its own purposes. And to be honest, it's the one book in the Apocrypha that I could just do without. <laughs> I just don't like it. I had to write a chapter on it. I don't like it. Fair enough. Um, and then we have something called Second Esdras, but that's a misnomer because what is called Second Esdras is actually an amalgamation of three apocalypses. Hmm. A Jewish apocalypse, which is generally referred to as Fourth Ezra, that's the middle chunk of Second Esdras. Um, and that, by the way, I just have to say, is a really important book. Okay. It is perhaps the most honest and far-reaching example of a Jew wrestling with the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Mm. And worse than that, the fact that God has let the Romans get off scot-free and keep prospering and even expanding their bloody empire mm. when he should be trouncing them. I mean, it's fine. You punished us. We were bad. You punished us. No problem. But they're worse. Mm -hmm. How can you allow them to continue? Great, uh, 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 great wrestling and, and so much theological depth in that book. And that and is part of Second as And that is the, the, the middle 12 chapters of, of Second Esdras. Gotcha. And Christians valued that book. Mm -hmm. um, so one Christian comes along and writes a preface to it. The first two chapters of what we call Second Esdras, a Christian addition. It's later than Fourth Ezra, so we call it Fifth Ezra, because that's how we roll. <laughs> and then uh, that's about like 120, 130 AD. And then another Christian comes along uh, in the third century AD and writes an epilogue to it, chapters 15 and 16 of what we call Second Esdras. Since it's later than Fourth and Fifth Ezra, we call it Six Ezra. <laughs> now, what happened to Second and Third Ezra? That's what inquiring minds want to know. This goes into a morass of trouble, but the bottom line is it's because Ezra and Nehemiah and some Septuagint codices come out as Esdras A or Esdras Alpha and Esdras Beta and stuff like that. So it's a mess. We never really know what Third Ezra is. We just know that there are so many ways of talking about Ezra, Nehemiah, and first Esdras, that we're going to start with fourth Ezra <laughs> up here <laughs> when, we, when we deal with second Esdras. But second Esdras is well worth reading. You can skip first Esdras and not really have missed much. Great. The books of the Maccabees. Yes. Give us um, the Maccabees. First and second Maccabees are vitally important. Mm. Historically speaking, they are the most important books of the Apocrypha because they are uh, windows into the tumultuous history of Judea from 175 BC to 141 BC. Um, the time in which uh, the Jerusalem elites um, try to lead the charge into Hellenization because we want to put Jerusalem on the international map. We want to get a piece of the of the Grecian pie and 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 uh, not be regarded as backwoods barbarians. And that just backfires horribly, leading to um, a period of what could be called the first genuine repression of Judaism as such, as a way of life. And under Antiochus IV attempts to, um, um, to break all loyalty to Jewish practices in the Torah uh, for the sake of absorbing Judeans into the mix of the Greek population, because it seems like the only way to control them. That attempt on Antiochus IV's part 
backfires even worse, and the Maccabean uh, Revolution breaks out. So this is really exciting stuff. So exciting that Mel Gibson really wanted to make a movie of this story. Yeah. Uh, but his screenwriter produced something um, unmanageable. And I sent him a copy of my book, Day of Atonement, <laughs> a novelization of, <laughs> of this period, and said, Mel, I've got you covered. I've the got digital covered. version and the you analog make, version. You make, you make a screenplay out of this and you will have told the story. But it's a fabulous story. Um, um, uh, first, in that we have the first genuine Jewish martyrs mm. uh, in literature who, who endure torture to the point of death rather than willingly violate the covenant. And then, of course, we have the Hasmonean of the Maccabean revolution that um, uh, not only restores the religious freedom of Judea, but eventually leads to the establishment of an independent political dynasty for the first time in Judean history since 596 BC. Now, while it was short-lived, and while basically only one generation of that dynasty was good, it was still something, darn it. It was the first taste of political independence in over 400 years. Um, so, great stuff. Then and it start. sets up a lot of the, um, the the political dynamics that we read about in the New Testament as well, with Herod and him being an Idumean and the, the, the family twisted, gnarled root of a family tree that the, the Herod had. Um, that is kind of, that comes out of nowhere if you just turn the page from Malachi to Matthew. But Maccabees gives that, here's how it got to that state. At least it gives a piece of that. It right. doesn't give us as much as you've just said, but it does fill in a very important three-decade gap. Mm -hmm. Then we kind of have to turn to Josephus, Josephus and to know yeah, about yeah. the Herods and the the, um, the 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 fiasco that was Roman rule <laughs> in Judea. Um, so those the first two Maccabees, the, the right? first and second Maccabees. Oh, and by the way, I mean. Um, this is where first we we really get to understand what zeal for the law is all about mm -hmm. and it really helps explain what paul is doing when he's persecuting the christians mm. uh, it, it it helps us understand that he like so many regard covenant keeping as an issue of national security so we've got to we, we've got to police our own mm -hmm. and it also gives us um I'll get in some trouble for saying this, but I will say um, maybe our earliest expression, clear expression of resurrection of the body mm -hmm. as vindication for for fidelity to the covenants. And that would be in Second Maccabees 6 and 7. Um, so yes, a, then, is that the story of the mother and her sons? The mother and her sons. Don't yeah. give out. Don't give anything else away now. No spoilers. <laughs> no spoilers for those Go who read haven't it, read folks. the story yet. In fact, if you haven't read it before, read it to your kids at bedtime tonight. <laughs> Second Maccabees 6, 18 through 7, 42. <laughs> It'll be a great bedtime story. You can all yes. explore it together as a and family. Film it and put it on uh, Instagram stories so we can see the reaction as you're reading it. <laughs> I'm going to get sued for that. I know tag it. David DeSilva <laughs> in the comments. <laughs> I'm going to be paying someone's therapy bills. <laughs> so, okay, anyway, third, third and fourth Maccabees. Third Maccabees, as you rightly note, has nothing to do with Maccabees. So why on earth do we call it Maccabees? Probably because the story is so parallel to the story of second Maccabees. Hmm. So it, it, it was probably originally called Ptolemaica, things pertinent to the Ptolemaic dynasty, or a Ptolemaic story, if mm -hmm. you will. Uh, but, uh, so it's a complete misnomer, 3rd Maccabees. We'll just accept that. We won't try to, to justify it. But it's, it's, a, a, it's, it's a story that brings home to the diaspora Jewish community in Egypt their connectedness to the temple, to the fate of the temple that um, that we read about for Judean uh, Jews in Second Maccabees, they they start off in the same way, uh, essentially, 
and um, and the the rebuke of a Greek overlord in the temple leads uh, eventually to the persecution of Jews in his realm. Mm. Um, and, and it's a story, again, just of, of the miraculous deliverance of these Jews. Um, it gives us also a window into the tension between apostate Jews and faithful Jews. We don't normally think about this, but the, the hatred that faithful Jews bear toward apostate Jews is, is no less than the venom that Gentiles and Jews might have for each other mm -hmm. in times of persecution. Mm -hmm. You can understand why the apostate basically has given public testimony. Oh, no, no, no. Being Jewish isn't worth uh, my skin. I'll happily become Greek and enjoy your favor. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that, that breach of fidelity and solidarity is just unforgivable. So the story ends uh, kind of with this wish fulfillment dream of faithful Jews um, executing the apostates in their midst. Mm. That one would also make a good movie, but we'll move on <laughs> to Fourth Maccabees, um, uh, which retells the story of Second Maccabees 6 and 7, but does so with a very philosophical goal in mind. From beginning to end, what this author wants to assert is, by following the Torah faithfully, we will achieve um, what Greek sages only wish for. Mm -hmm. we, 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 will, we, we have demonstrated in our history that by uh, being schooled in Torah and being disciplined by doing Torah, we can attain absolute mastery of our emotions, our impulses, our fears, our uh, even physical sensations. And so we will fulfill the Greek ideal of the sage, of the noble person, of the virtuous person, far better than any Greek is able to. And I think this is a text that is directed toward highly Hellenized Jews who also need to understand that what they bring to the table in their Greek cities is at least as valuable, if not more valuable, than what the Greeks have brought to the table, so that they can remain invested in, committed to their own ancestral heritage, and not think that they are somehow second-class Greeks for being Jews. That's also the book in which I've invested most of my time among all of these apocryphal texts, having written not like anybody cares, a commentary on 4th Maccabees, <laughs> as well as a guide and a book of essays. So, But I, I love this book because it is such a wondrous blend of, of Torah fidelity and Greek philosophical and literary um, uh, finesse. And so it's the most Greek of the Apocrypha, while it's also the most, well, I won't say the most, but also uh, uh, staunch in its promotion of a fully Torah observant life, showing that they're really not at all incompatible after all. And that is the apocrypha, folks. If you've, uh, is that, did we leave out any books? Did I forget well, any? No, no, no. I, I, I just need to, um, to, to uh, clarify for our viewers what we just called the apocrypha is really the expanded apocrypha as we talk about it or as we see it in the NRSV or the um, uh, Common English Bible or, or other modern Bibles with the Apocrypha in it, classically speaking, the Apocrypha is much smaller. Classically speaking, it's just the books that are in the Roman Catholic canon that are not in the Protestant canon. Uh, so that would not include first and second Esdras, it would not include third and fourth Maccabees, mm -hmm. nor prayer of Manasseh, nor Psalm 151. But a number of those books are included in the Orthodox canon. So for the sake of a more inclusive apocrypha, our printed apocryphas, like the Lexham one that, mm -hmm. that JM was showing, or you know any Oxford annotated apocrypha, mm -hmm. uh, have more books because they also have what's in the Orthodox canons. But even at that, 4th Maccabees isn't in anyone's canon. 
it's just a cool book and I'm glad they didn't leave it out. <laughs> the that was a viewer question that people had <clears throat> was the different tr the different apocryphas or the different lists and, and canonical lists. And um, I, I I would recommend, guys, this is the first edition. Do you have the second? Do you have the newer edition handy? Why, yes, JM. I just <laughs> have to have it. So, and by the way, this uh, the first edition isn't worth anything anymore. So just <laughs> throw this out. Thing. You the real edition and, is the and second I'll, edition. I'll, tra I'll trade you a copy of this for some dojo swag. <laughs> <laughs> Done. <laughs> Done. So, folks, get uh, your copy of introducing the Apocrypha because it does, in a much more expanded version, a little of what we did and what I wanted to do in this interview, which was to just give you an introduction of flavor. And at the end of last year, one of the things I was doing was reading, I would read an apocryphal book. Uh, I, I chose the, the any REB, the NEB, the old New English Bible. And because it was an unfamiliar translation to me right. and it had the apocrypha. And so yeah. I would read a book from the apocrypha in that. And then I would read David's chapter on that book in introducing the apocrypha. And it really did help me anchor my mind around these, what would otherwise be weird and foreign books to me as a lifelong Protestant Christian that, you know, never grew up with them. So I, that's one way I would recommend people maybe engage. Uh, there are other ways out there and there are good introductions. His, um, the, his, the Lexham Apocrypha, he wrote the introduction and each introduction to each book in this one. And this does include First Enoch and the uh, Psalms of Solomon in it. So if you're interested in that, viewers, there are a lot of resources out there, and I highly commend those to you. Dave, we're going to have you back on because this we, we did a long discussion of the Apocrypha. And rather than trying to cram in a little bit uh, at the tail end about your book, Honor, Patriot, Kidship, and Purity, it'd be more fun to have you on to do a full deep dive on that at some point and do it the justice that it deserves. Thank so you, before you go... I hear that you, some of the places you teach are pretty interesting, including a cruise ship in the Mediterranean. What is that all about? It's the best gig a professional scholar can get. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there's, there's a tour company known as Educational Opportunities Tours. And um, on their cruise offerings, they feature guest lecturers who who might lecture on a, on a wide variety of things. I always try to focus on, um, on the sites that we are about to visit. So for example, in, I believe September coming up, I am supposedly the guest lecture on a Passages of the Bible cruise, which will take us to Cairo and Alexandria, to Jerusalem and Galilee, um, Athens, Corinth, Ephesus, uh, so these are all really rich sites for both Old and New Testament history. Mm -hmm. So I'll be presenting on the At Sea Days several lectures about uh, about the various sites themselves and their relevance for thinking about Scripture, the world of Scripture, particular texts of Scripture. Um, and if one were interested, <laughs> I do have to say these cruises are beastly expensive. And yeah, they're not, not cheap. The, if I were not the guest lecturer, there's <laughs> no way I'd be doing this because I'm cheap. <laughs> not going to lie. Not going to lie. Um, but uh, you could look up on Educational Opportunities Tours website mm -hmm. and look at uh, biblical cruises. And there's a wide variety uh, to, to choose from, different dates, depending on individual schedules, different, yeah. many different speakers. Of course, I, I will say this. They aren't mine, but <laughs> only go on David De Silva's cruises. The rest, pff, who needs? Well, it? actually, Ben Witherington has one. That would be great. All right. OK, we'll allow. We like That'll Ben, so we'll allow that one. <laughs> no, I, I will say this. The they the cruise uh, study on the cruise ship, it when you first look at it, you're like, oh, my gosh, that looks expensive. But actually, when you look at what a normal cruise and around the Mediterranean cost, it's you're really not that much more expensive. So for people who are like want to do a vacation, but want to do more than just go sip drinks and, you know, see random sites with no background, 
something like educational opportunities. My parents have been on multiple educational oh, opportunities, yes. cruise, not cruises. They went on trips to the Holy Land on, on land. But the it's a great way to see, not just see the world, but to see the world and connect it with what you're reading in scripture. So I actually am a big fan of that type of thing. I wish Disciple Dojo had the infrastructure to do that kind of stuff because I would do those I all the time. I wish you did too, Jan. You're fun <laughs> to hang out with. We would have know. a blast. We would we go. Would. We would. Um, maybe I, my wife crazy, but we'd have a blast. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed meeting your wife at SBL. She was such a sweetheart. And, and I, I, she's also, I can tell the two of you have a great rapport and she's, she's probably a patient woman. I could, there's probably a fair amount of eye rolling that I'm sure she does every now and then when you're together, but it reminds me of my parents and their dynamic. (laughs) Folks, check out Education Opportunities, though, if you're interested in that. It is a really cool way to get to see the the world of the Bible and, and to do it on a cruise, which is always fun. David, it's been a pleasure chatting with you, uh, almost as fun as chatting in person in Denver. Uh, are, is there anything else you want to let folks know about what's going on, what's coming up or something you're excited about that they should know about? Yeah, Jam, there's one more um, opportunity that I want people to know about just because it's it's such a good program that's been put together. Um, Tutku Tours is another travel company based in Izmir, Turkey, hmm. um, and they specialize also in kind of educational, biblical focused educational events. And they put together in 2021 a global Smyrna meeting, which involved a um, a tour of the of the archaeological remains of the seven cities in which John's seven churches uh, were located uh, when he wrote Revelation and to whom he wrote Revelation. And they combined the tour with a series of lectures by noted scholars on each of those sites, as well as Patmos and what have you. And uh, the second Global Smyrna meeting is coming up this June, uh, June 4th through 10th, with a possible add-on uh, up front. So maybe June 1st to 10th, depending on, on how much people want to get into it. But um, this will be a great lineup, better than the f- first mid-pandemic <laughs> lineup. <laughs> uh, we have... Ben Witherington uh, uh, talking, and Mark Wilson, whose name might not be familiar to many of your viewers, but he is, I would say, he's just the king of biblical Turkey archaeology. Um, so, and in fact, he's organizing the whole event. I'm wow. going to present uh, on Ephesus. But uh, um, the the programming, the touring, it's also well integrated to give sort of a, a a real immersive experience into the world of revelation that i think if you're if you're into thinking about revelation differently from the left behind series on which a you should like be this, which you should be would really um be potentially worth looking into tutku tours second global smyrna meeting um, perfect google that and you'll find it That's awesome. And it's perfect timing, uh, folks, because as some of you may or may not have known, we just Sean McDonough and I had a great discussion. He was my Revelation professor and Revelation is another book that David's done a lot of work on. I'm going to this was off the cuff, but I'm going to plug one of your other books. Unholy Allegiances. This is uh, a great, it's it's short, so folks, don't be intimidated. This is a phenomenal book about the background of what was going on in Revelation at those seven churches, the cultural pressures they were facing, and Revelation's message to them in the face of those pressures. So if you want to learn that, check out his book. If you want to learn it in person, check out the trip that he just mentioned. I'll put links in the description below. All right. Well, let's get you out of here, David. Thank you so much for coming. You're going to come back. You and I are going to be in touch. We're going to get another time. You're going to come back to the dojo because this is just too fun to only do it one time and be one and done. So Mm -hmm. thank you so much for your warmth, your candor, and your patient guide uh, work through the apocryphal maze that is just so weird for so many people out there. You've made it a little less weird today. So thank you for that. My pleasure, Sensei. (laughs) All right, we'll see you next time.
So guys, I hope you enjoyed that discussion. We had such a fun time. And here's the thing. We didn't even get to half of what I wanted to talk to David about because we just ran out of time. So he suggested, and I think it was a great suggestion, that he come back and we do a part two of this discussion where we get into some of his work involving honor, patronage, kinship, purity, reciprocity, all of those background New Testament concepts that he is a renowned expert in. So he's going to come back and we're going to do this again. Be sure to check that out. I so enjoy talking to David De Silva. Go read anything you can find that he's written. Check the video description for links to his books, to his website, blog, as well as the trips that he's going to be speaking on over in the Mediterranean. All of that information will be in the video description below. So check it out. Until then, thanks for watching Disciple Dojo. We really appreciate each and every one of you. Have a great weekend.